Hey guys, this is Comic Uno, and today I'm doing Comic Uno's best comics of the week, and sorry that there is no editing in this video, it's just been a long day and I wasn't able to edit, edit it if I wanted to post it on Wednesday, because uh, I'm actually recording this at like 9, so it's already going to be posted late, so next week will be the regular clean uh, review, so I'm sorry about that, but let's get into the comics. So this week I have 11 books, and of course with this show we go least favorite to best pick of the week, and number 11 for me is Young Justice issue 13. So Young Justice, I want to like this book so much because I really like a lot of these characters, but I just feel like it's just too much too soon. There's just so much to balance in, in this, uh, in this comic, and First, we get to see Superboy in his own little world, like Conan-esque world going on. And then we have all the Wonder Comics characters trying to, to have their own adventure. And it's just, it's a lot to deal with. And then in the end, there's even more characters introduced, which is, you know, characters I definitely like. We get to see, uh, spoiler, Aqualad, Arrowette, and Sideways, which is cool. But, yeah, that that's a lot of characters to, to juggle and that's kind of been my disappointment with this book it's just it's just too much too soon and the artwork is uh, different but at least it is for different segments so I understand that and also jumps a lot you know it's just like okay Superboy story didn't end but we're gonna go here and uh, yes yeah, it's just a lot didn't really love the issue I feel like you didn't really get a lot of the, the characters dialogue besides the Superboy because he's alone and the 20 other characters have, like, the same thing to say over and over again. Naomi's just like, hey, yeah, I've only been doing this for two days. Y you know I'm only had powers for two days, right? And that's, like, all her dialogue. So, Young Justice issue 13 gets two stars, and that is number 11. And again, I'll try showing images. I'm so sorry the, of the non-editing this week. But yeah, moving on to number 10, which is the Immortal Hulk issue 1. So, uh, the great power, not just Immortal Hulk, but I actually was really looking forward to this issue, and I, you know, I love Spider-Man, I've been loving the Immortal Hulk, but I do, I don't love throwing this word around, but I'm gonna throw it for this one. It's a bit of a cash grab, you know, they see, all right, Spider-Man's really popular, Immortal Hulk is really popular, let's just put those two together, and it didn't really feel like there was a necessary story to tell, there was not a real emotional heart for me, which is surprising, because Tom Taylor's so good at that, and it was just really like, okay, what if Spider-Man became Hulk, and that's pretty much it, uh, he teams up with other heroes along the way to try to figure out how not to be Hulk, and Bruce Banner realizing that Peter is actually a smart dude, and... Other than that, I, I just feel like there wasn't as much emotional resonance. I do think the artwork was very good for this book. Uh, you know, the, anything, the action was very good. Um, but, yeah, I just wasn't really feeling the story for this one, especially because it's $4.99, so it's a little bit of a pricey book. Uh, just didn't really do it for me. So that is number 10, and I gave that two and a half stars. Moving on to number 9, which is Ant-Man issue 1. So this is a book I was really looking forward to. Because I I really like Scott and I'm, I'm a huge Cassie Lang fan. And I thought this was going to be a book that was about both of them. But it's not really. Uh, you know, I think the successes of this book is that it's really funny. You know, from the, the, the first panel or really first couple of pages too. Uh, we get to see like Cassie cursing uh, up a storm. And Scott's like, my daughter won't do that on the field. He's like, well, I was a young Avenger. And I, you know, I did that. So I thought that was fun. And even though, I mean, my biggest problem was that Cassie was so so out of character in this book, but I like some of the jokes she did say, like her father living in an anthill, and it's like, you live in an anthill? I thought you at least lived in that house, you know? And it's just like, of course you live in an anthill. So up to that point, I actually really enjoyed the humor a lot, and then Cassie's totally kicked out of the book, and then we get to see like this B story, like not just the letter B, like B-E-E, -E. bees are involved here. And, uh, you know, I think they're trying to make it fun and humorous, but that part honestly kind of bored me a little. It, it dragged out and I'm like, oh, is this going to be the rest of the, the miniseries? So uh, going back to Cassie, she was really out of character. Uh, her just yelling at her dad and just not respecting him. I understood why she did that in Nick Spencer's run. I think he made 
a, a case for it and and then they resolved their issues and they worked together and and really loved each other because the one thing like the literal basis of Cassie's character is how much she loves her dad and how much she wanted to be her dad so her just like yelling at him is like you're not good enough I'm gonna go hang out with my stepdad who hated her and, and my mom who yeah they're on good terms now but it took a while to get there so it's just like such a strange dynamic and I mean hopefully it goes somewhere like it did with Spencer's run but it just felt like it, it picked up the beginnings of Spe Spencer's run and didn't really understand the full arc of it so I was really disappointed with that but uh, obviously I'll pick up the rest see where it goes but I was a little disappointed with this issue but if you're just a Scott Lang fan I think you there will be maybe a little bit more forgiveness for Cassie but uh, it's a big part of the book, and, and obviously I'm, I'm a big fan of that character. And the artwork is, um, I think, really works for this book a lot. So I'm going to show you some of that artwork. It's kind of cartoony, a little bit more on the humorous side. I think they do the facial expressions really well. So I, I do think the artwork was pretty solid for this book. So I'm going to give that three stars, and that was number nine. Moving on to number eight, which is Buffy the Vampire Slayer issue 12. So Buffy, I, I don't even know how much we have of this event. I think maybe we have one more tie-in for this one. No, this is actually the last tie-in for the event. So we'll see where that goes. But it, it's the last issue, hopefully, with just the supporting characters. Not that I dislike them. I love the supporting characters. But um, like I said in my previous re reviews, I feel like for a Buffy book and only issue 12, I want to see a bit more Buffy and, and learn about her as a character within this universe. So uh, I did really like Cordelia and Rose, though. I thought their interaction was cool, and Cordy was just so in character in, the, in, this, uh, in this issue where she's working at this diner, seafood, fast food place, and then... And there's like these zombie type men coming to her. He's like, hey, I just cleaned that window. Like, I love like how fearless she is. She doesn't care about the, the supernatural thing going on. She's just like more concerned about the window she just cleaned. So I thought that was really in character. And I liked uh, how Rose and Cordelia were able to relate to each other. So I hope we get to see more of that in the future because it's unlikely dynamic. And the Willow and Xander stuff, I think, is going off the rails a little bit. Uh, I feel like they've started arcs that took a really long time for them to grow into in the show for a reason, and they're just speeding it up. And uh, I, I think it's a little bit too rushed, some of the storylines. But I like the characters that, you know, they, they definitely portray here. I don't love the artwork. I, I still always have the issue with those, like, buggy eyes. Anya doesn't even really look like Anya that much, and, and some of the characters don't have their likeness as much. But... Overall, I'm going to give this three stars. It wasn't a bad issue by any means, but I, I do want to see Buffy in, in a regular arc for this book that's not forcibly uh, connected to Hellmouth, because I, I still think it was too soon for an event. All right, moving on to number seven, which is Batman issue 88. So uh, I, I thought this was a pretty good issue. I liked... Catwoman a lot here. Um, surprisingly, I think she steals the show once again. I guess not surprisingly, but it's her journey of uh, being connected to this crime that I guess happened a couple of years ago or this this character and she's connected again that she can't tell Batman stuff even though she wants to and and her past kind of is lurking within this story. So I like that there's a lot of villains still in this issue, but I think they're able to balance it a little bit better here. There's some exposition, of course, but uh, yeah, the ending was kind of cool. We get to see Harley and Catwoman's going to team up there, so that, that was interesting. But overall, uh, I actually, like I said, I like the Catwoman stuff a bit more than the Batman stuff, which was weird. Uh, but I think it's going in the right track. It's definitely a slow burn, but... I, I think some of the dynamics they're building here is, is pretty interesting. So uh, hopefully we learn more about this villain. But Batman issue 88 gets three and a half stars, and that is number seven. Moving on to number six, which is X-Men Fantastic Four issue one, probably uh, one of the bigger books that came out this week. And I, I like this book, actually. I really, I, I felt like it was, it was very interesting to see a regular mutant story, you know, the kid who is the outsider and, you know, has to go to the Xavier school, pretty much. And, you know, usually it's like the parents are like, no, my kid's not a mutant, you know, I don't want to do this. They can't leave me. And you get to see that from the reverse, you know, a superhero family that is celebrated for their powers, even though, like, the X-Men, they have powers, what makes them different, you know? And uh, we already knew that Franklin was a mutant, and they already knew he was a mutant, so it wasn't really a story about that, but it was a story about how they didn't believe in Krakoa's 
philosophies. And, you know, I think both Sue and Reed make wrong decisions in this issue, which was interesting, kind of see them as um, faulted humans and flawed humans. I thought that was very cool. Uh, the, the nitpicks, I would say, was maybe some of the X-Men continuity. I mean, I'm a huge Kitty fan, as you guys know, but I was a little confused how she got on Krakoa, because, like, the whole point of Marauders is that she can't get on Krakoa. Like, that's a big part of the book, and then here she's just, like, in Krakoa. I guess the only real, the only, uh, rationalization I can make with it is that they said she can't go by herself to Krakoa. So maybe if someone takes her with her, she can get in, but... That wasn't really stated in Marauders, and she never had been in Krakoa, so why do we have it in this book? It was kind of weird to me, and that that was a really sore thumb uh, in, in the issue for me. Artwork is pretty good. It's not my favorite style, and I do think some of the coloring, it, it kind of gets meshed to the background. I don't think it pops as much, but uh, it's not, again, not my favorite art style, but I think it, it fits for the narrative pretty well. So I'm going to give uh, X-Men Fantastic Four issue one three and a half stars. I thought it was a pretty fun issue that kind of puts a lot of uh, common Marvel themes in a new light with very famous characters of their universe. So I thought that was pretty cool and I'm, I'm excited to see Franklin's journey. So moving on to number five, which is Incredibles 2 Slow Burn issue one. And I really loved the, the previous miniseries. I liked that it wasn't short stories. It had its own arc going on. So I, I really enjoyed that. This one I had a really interesting theme, which is why it was so high for me, uh, where we get to see somehow they released this 1950 storyline. So if you watch Incredibles 2, you I didn't know this from Incredibles 1, but it's based in the 50s. So that was kind of weird about the whole technology story. But I still think for today's audience, it was interesting to see that you know, our society is moving so fast because of technology and um, how we react to technology. So I thought that was a really interesting theme to play with. And then by the end, we get to see a character who's able to really uh, attack the Incredibles through, uh, I guess the Incredibles not thinking about what they're doing first. It, it's someone who uh, is playing a chess match and is one step ahead of them. And then in the end of the issue, we get to see Dash uh, doesn't have his powers anymore. And he's kind of going to have to live to learn a, to learn to live a life with, you know, not not speeding through things. And it was cool to look into insecurities of Dash, um, not insecurities, but I guess the, the faults of both of them is that Dash, you know, moves too quickly in things. And then same thing for Violet, even though she's grown and not felt invisible she she does paint herself into the background sometimes so i thought that was interesting to pull up some of the stuff from incredibles one to to put into the incredibles 2 storyline so i enjoyed it i thought it was a really solid book if you like this franchise i think they're doing a really fun stuff with it and, and fun like one shot stories or may not one shot stories but like mini arcs so i'm gonna give that four stars and that is number five moving on to number four which is Crowded, issue 11. So Crowded, um, I'm so upset this is ending soon. I, I love this book. And this was a really interesting issue. And I think it, it as you get to read it more, it ties in very well uh, to make this full issue. Because uh, at the beginning, I'm like, oh, this is like a lot of exposition about this cult. And then you get into the like more raw emotions where I really enjoyed the issue. And well, anyways, they're in a cult pretty much. And uh, people who just love guns. They have pictures of guns. They just love guns. Uh, but they, they also don't really go out in the outside world. And they are okay with Charlie for some reason. We don't really know why. Like everyone else wants to get the money. Why are they okay with Charlie? So... In the mix of all this, you know, Charlie's trying to say, like, I don't really trust these people. And Vita does. She's like, no, I, I like this place. And it challenges their own ro relationship, their own romantic relationship of realizing, okay, we've only been together for two, not even together, but we've only been interacting with each other, known each other for two weeks, and we're, we're going through some life and death situations here, and maybe that's why we like each other. Uh, so Vita is really in the point of view of, like, I don't know my feelings, and Charlie's like, I kind of fell in love with you, and I, I don't know how to feel about that, and there's just a really interesting, raw conversation between the two that I loved, and why I love this book so much. So overall, and artwork is fun and funny, and the dog is in it a lot, and he's amazing and cute. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of good twists and turns here, a lot of good character beats, and I will be sad to see this uh, go, but I'm glad it's going to be ending in a graphic novel, I think. So Crowded Issue 11 gets four stars, and that is number four. Moving on to number three, 
which is uh, Power Rangers issue, well, Power Rangers Teen Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles issue three. And this is just a ton of fun. I can only imagine if you're a fan of both franchises, this must like be blowing your mind. And But just as a Power Rangers fan and like the semi knowledge I know about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, I'm having a blast with it. Uh, I, you know, the thing I enjoy the most is uh, the interactions, which is exactly what you want from a crossover. Uh, you know, the beginning where I'm just like, Oh, here's Rita and Shredder, you know, but from like a, a character point of view, it's so cool to see like these, these top villains of these universes interacting with each other. I think the slowest part was probably the Tommy storyline, ironically enough. And then it, it definitely picks up with the different uh, interactions we get to see with the Rangers and then a different Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle where you get to learn a little bit more about their relationship and I thought that was cool and then in the end we get to see the Power Rangers lose their abilities and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles including April have to become the Rangers which I was like oh my god this is gonna be so cool just love what uh the creative team is doing uh with this crossover it's just I think it's blowing its limits in out of the park uh it's it's really cool and just such a fun book and you know compared to like power rangers which surprisingly enough sometimes has to be a bit more serious because of the stories they're telling it's cool just to have funny jokes about jelly beans on pizza and i i think the jokes really land here really well too so uh, artwork is pretty solid too I, it's a little darker than you would expect but i think it works really well and yeah overall i thought it was a really fun issue so i'm gonna give that four stars and that is number three Moving on to number two, uh, much higher than it usually is, and that is the Magnificent Miss Marvel issue 12. I thought this was a really, really solid issue where we get to see still Kamala's dad is on the, the surgery table here, uh, and that's been going on for a while, but it's Doctor Strange saying, hey, Kamala, you can save your dad with your blood, but you gotta get here now or else, you know, uh, there can be some things that happen, you know, he might not be able to walk or there'll, there'll be consequences. So Kamala is also dealing with Josh getting attacked by her own costume. And she's like, well, I have to make sure he's okay. And, and she might regret that because now her dad might have to walk with a cane for the rest of his life, but is okay. He was able to survive it. But it was a really interesting pick where it's not even a question for Kamala. It's like, yeah, I love my dad, but I need to make sure everyone's okay. And, and through all this, we also get to see Bruno uh, dealing in Kamala, dealing with their feelings together, you know, and I love this kind of little secret they have because if you, it, it ties back to the beginning of this series. They they had the secret of Miss Marvel and then it kind of grew to other people and it wasn't that like Kamala's ashamed of their relationship, but it's like, no, I kind of like that this is just for us and I really enjoyed that because it kind of brought me back to like the beginning of Miss Marvel and the nostalgia of that. I mean, I know she's not that old of a character, but um, it's cool. It was cool to see that. So, and artwork is always really solid for this book uh, and, and really works for the like, slice of life slash high school slash uh, superhero nature of this book. So, overall, a lot of fun. And I thought this was one of the better issues of the book. So, given that four stars. And that is number two. So, number one for me is Marauders. And... I, I was really happy with this issue, but when I was skimming through it, I was like, oh no, where's Kitty? Where's Kitty? What's going on? I have to wait another issue to find out what happened to Kitty. But I actually like the tension they built here. And they, they have a character we haven't seen in a while, which is Callisto from the actual Marauders, like the the reason that they have their names, uh, the, the underground uh, people. So I thought that was really cool. And I love the opening where we get to see Emma's like has no clothes on and she's like, what's going on? Like, what am I doing here? And she's like, oh, I want you to be like a model because that's what you used to do. So it was just like this really interesting, fun opening. And then we get to see Callisto interacting with, I forget um, what that, the character, the underground character is, but the, one of the, her friends. Uh, and they realize, hey, you know, we're, we're tired of living in the shadows. We're, we're tired of it. And it'd be kind of cool to, to live on the surf, not cool, but to, to be able to live in the light, I guess. And uh, so I thought that was interesting. And we still don't know what happened to Kitty, but I, I like the ending where they, you know, her absence is definitely clear. And then Emma, like, does she know something? Because they have the, uh, Emma and, um, the Black King kind of have this conversation where... 
it seemed like Emma is either lying for Kitty, but this is the interaction. She let me know she was detained while doing the great work of returning our people home. Did she, did she now? Krakoa save her? Indeed. Enjoy today, Sebastian. So, is, does she know that she's missing? Is she lying for her? Like, I kind of like the mystery that was built there. And then we get to see Lockheed at the end of the issue. And he's not doing so great. Uh, he might be dead. And it's like, oh my god, can Lockheed even be saved in Krakoa? Where was Kitty? So I actually really like the mystery they built because I was really worried where they're like, okay, they're just gonna prolong this cliffhanger. But it's not about prolonging, it's about building tension. I thought they did that really well here. Artwork is fantastic for this book. So overall, uh, really enjoyed this issue. I thought it was really solid, um, even with the absence of one of their lead characters. So Marauders issue 7 gets four stars and that is number one so hopefully you guys enjoyed let me know in the comments below what you thought this is comic you know uh and also go check out my twitter and facebook go check out my comics like father like daughter and they call her dancer and everything um uh on comic books every tuesday for comic book weekly and that is at 10 p.m eastern time so definitely go check that out as well hopefully you guys enjoyed bye